So we were talking about the the external circumstances to be accepted as an environment and an occasion for that development. So we said these circumstances are perhaps the best ones as an occasion for that inner development. But the thing is, do we have the strength and the courage to accept the circumstances as the best ones for our inner progress? That's where is the whole struggle of life. The moment that there is, when there is a bit of difficulty or suffering or inconvenience or discomfort, then we begin to say, oh no, this is not the right thing. I must change places, go to a better job and here and there. But you have seen basically the problems do not change. It is only maybe you get a higher salary and a better salary and maybe a more comfortable house. But the problem that you have been facing in one company would be, would be you know, continuing in the other company also. Because not only here in Pondicherry and in Sadhana that you are, you know, the mother would say that the, by changing circumstances you don't change the problems of life or not do you get the solutions to life. So even in the common life of non-sadhana, we have seen that whatever are your inner problems are the problems that continue wherever you are. You may change even in your country, thinking, no, no, this country is not good for me. That you run away from that to go to Europe and from Europe to come to India. But problems keep changing you, uh, keep chasing you. That's because these circumstances, they are there to change your inner being and to bring to your inner being a kind of a different evolutionary progress. So that's what it is, but we need to have, as I said, tremendous courage, faith in the divine, that I will stay put on and face my problem. So it is much more relevant in sadhana because here, when we come to yoga and sadhana, the problems become much more acute more even sometimes violent. And if one runs away from here, then there is no solution. But it depends on your faith your, and your trust in the divine. It is a world of mutual help and struggle, not a serene and peaceful gliding through easy joys is the progress it allows us. Because basically what we have to understand is this world at present, I am using the word at present, is a world which is full of struggle. And uh, it is not really a serene and peaceful gliding place to, to get your easy joys. The reason being that at present each one of us is a hardcore egoist. So because of this, we want to have things for ourselves, for myself, the way I want it. So if each one of us is thinking like that, what happens? Obviously, we end up in competition, in struggle, in beating up each other, in violence, everything. So there is a constant tussle, not only between the human individuals, Added to this problem, there are these occult powers which are themselves trying to win over the human beings for their own work, for their own support, for their own satisfaction. And added to that, there are the national egos. Added to that, there are the religious egos. Added to that, there are community egos. So you can see this world is a big arena of clashing of forces. Individual, collective, national, religious, all kinds of egos are there battling, each one trying to take a scoop of this earth. So he says, we can't expect a kind of an easy armchair life living in this world. At present at least. In the future world, yes. Because when these ego clashes become less, when mankind really realizes a kind of a unity, based on, on spirituality, then maybe we can look forward to a kind of a 
time of peace and harmony and joy it is no good to keep crying for harmony and joy and peace while we are living in this egoistic and mental and vital consciousness so let us accept the world that it at present that the world is not an easy going you know yellow brick path it is a place of struggle and therefore it says every step has to be gained by heroic effort and through a clash of opposing forces those who take up the inner and outer struggle even to the most physical clash of all that of war are the kshatriyas the mighty men so now we are going to get a description of the kshatriya the warrior the one who defends the country so it says now these defenders the kshatriyas are the one who really always take to the to wars as we said in this early times is the kshatriyas who went to the war field whereas the rest of the country was in peace so called peace but otherwise not in the normal way so these are the kshatriyas who have really they go through war force nobility courage are their nature protection of the right and the unflinching acceptance of the gauge of battle is their virtue and their duty now who is a kshatriya now there are two things one is kshatriya as a class as a clan and each class or a clan had its dharma its virtues its rules and regulations its do's and don'ts and in those times the kshatriya was one who faced clash of war and who was really there a battling force who showed nobility and courage protection of the right and unflinching acceptance of the gauge of battle is the virtue and and their and their duty for there is continuously a struggle between right and wrong justice and injustice the force that protects and the force that violates and oppresses and when this has once been brought to the issue of physical strife the champion and standard bearer of the right must not shake and tremble at the violent and terrible nature of the work he has to do you see when does kshatriya come into picture the warrior when this question of social justice and injustice all the social problems of right and wrong the struggle between morality and and those who are trying to destroy morality what we call the modern times you know the, the fundamentalists and the believers and all of them they come into a clash so when these clashes become so very acute that when a war breaks through because no more this injustice can be contained and countries go to war or na- or some of the smaller kingdoms go to war or whatever so at that time this politicians etc those who have created the problems they stand back and they order the army to say you go and bat- battle you go and face the war but those who cause this war are not the army people necessarily they are the other people the politicians the brahmin the, the shudras and the vaishyas but those who have to face the worst situation say if a country's diplomacy between two countries fails you know the the political people they fail maybe they have done something wrong and suddenly you know the two countries erupt in anger one prime minister one president of another country they they get into loggerheads what do they do they don't go out to fight they just telephone they give the message to the army chief saying you attack their country so is the poor the army has to face for the problems created by the other levels of society so it is this kind of an injustice and everything that comes on the physical level to the forefront and the kshatriya who has vowed taken a vow that he will stand he will be the standard bearer for the right and so he faces but he must not shake and tremble once the commander in chief says you go to battle finish then he does not judge did my politic did my president give me the right uh, uh, command did my prime minister tell me rightly he doesn't 
think on all those lines. He says, no, my honor is to defend the country and my country seems to be in trouble. I will go forward. So he does not, you know, shake and tremble at the violent and terrible nature of the work he has to do. He must not abandon his followers or fellow fighters, betray his cause and leave the standard of right and justice to trail in the dust and be trampled into mire by the blood-stained feet of the oppressor because of a weak pity for the violent and cruel and a physical horror of the vastness of the destruction decreed. Well, this of course is, applies to the times of Arjuna and Sri Krishna and the Kurukshetra as much as to the contemporary times. Even though the army may know that it's being sent to a fight where there would be uh, this uh, question of the vast the horror and vastness of the destruction decreed. He knows. And yet, that is his dharma. That he cannot betray his cause, he cannot abandon his fellow fighters, he cannot disobey his commanders. Sometimes he knows that my commander is sending me into an area where I will not be able to live, perhaps in the next five hours, ten hours, I'll be killed. But he is not the one who really thinks in this line of life for himself. His vision is always so broad because by, by, by training, I would say a soldier by training is a, is a much vaster ego than the normal civilian who thinks of his little self, his little family and his little business and his little profit. For the civilian, he comes first. But for the soldier out there in the front, the country comes first. He may have his family, his children, his parents. But he says, no, country is first, the, the family is next. For us, I am first, my family is next, my community is next, my, my state is next. And then if you have some time enough, we think of the country. And you see our great battle in Maharashtra, country has no place for Indians. We have all got states and our clans and our communities first. And country comes into picture only when Pakistan or China, when they attack you, and suddenly we say Bharat Mata, otherwise you say Mera Mata, you know. There's no question of thinking of the country. So we have this kind of a system. But here he says, this weak pity for the violent and the cruel, all this does not really deter the soldier. His virtue and his duty lie in battle and not in abstention from battle. It is not slaughter but non-slaying which would be, which would here be the sin. So that the conclusion of this para, that to kill is not a sin for an for a, for a army man, but non-slaying would be a sin. So you see, the value system completely changes. For a civilian, killing is a sin. But for the army man, non-killing becomes a sin. Why is it a sin for him? Because he is betraying the country. You see, you may kill here five people, or you may save here ten people by not killing. But if you have not killed your oppressor, who is really coming to your country bloodstained, then the, your entire country suffers. So it is kind of relative. Which is bigger, your country or you? So I want to save my country, then I don't mind getting into sin. So he says, the army man's values and our civilian values, they change completely. That's why this question of Gita comes into picture. What exactly is this question of killing and not killing? Who is killing? Who is not killed? And you have seen the different levels. The civilian level, the kshatriya level, then the spiritual level where Sri Krishna says, all are killed by me. You are not the killer. I am the one who has already slain all of them. You see, there are different levels and we have to understand these different levels. The teacher then turns aside for a moment to give another answer to the cry of Arjuna over the sorrow of the death of kindred, which will empty his life of the causes and objects of living. What is the true object of Kshatriya's life and his true happiness? So we have again, in fact, uh, a very beautiful paragraph 
on the Kshatriya code, again based on chapter 2 of the Bhagavad Gita, verses 31 to 37. Now, coming to the, the true object of Kshatriya's life. Not self-pleasing and domestic happiness and a life of comfort and peaceful joy with friends and relatives, but to battle for the right is his true object of life and to find a cause for which he can lay down his life or by victory win the crown and glory of the hero's existence is his greatest happiness. You see, the values change. He is not there to have a kind of a domestic happiness and a life of comfort and peaceful joy with friends and relatives. That's what a civilian does. Our happiness is this kind of a thing, a domestic happiness with your family and friends, you have parties, you have this and that. But for him, the true object is to find a cause for which he can lay down his life. You know, this is the... An idea that has been extended far beyond in the sense that it has been said in some religion that if you lay down your life in the war field, then you will go to heaven. So once you give this attachment of heaven after death, if you die in the battle, battlefield, then what happens? Then the Kshatriya, the military man, now he almost is itching for a cause, an occasion where he can fight and if necessary give up his life. And then he would say, if I, fight, if I lose my life in the battlefield, at least I go to heaven. Because that has been given the ideal of most of the, all philosophies in the world at present. That if you do good things, you will go to heaven, what we call Jannat, you go to paradise, you go to any place, that if you do good here, the good for a civilian is to follow religion, but the good for a Kshatriya or the warrior is to fight for the cause and lay your life there if need be. But the end of both the, the both their lives is to have a paradise, a seat in, in heaven. So, this way you kind of reach faster. Whereas in a civilian manner you may have to live a long, painful, discomforted, poor, poverty life and then, you know, if you really stick to religion in spite of all the problems and the depressions, you may, may not reach heaven. But where it is much more guaranteed. So, a lot of this uh, ideals, you know, the, the great ideal of jihad, as we have heard, is the same ideal. That if you can die for your religion, you get the fastest way to go to that paradise. So that, that is the thing, that you lay down his life or, or by victory win the crown and glory. Well, if you are not killed, be victorious and come back home as a great hero. There is no greater good for the Kshatriya than righteous battle. And when such a battle comes to them of itself, like the open gate of heaven, happy are the Kshatriyas then. If thou dost not this battle for the right, then thou hast, then hast thou abandoned thy duty and virtue and thy glory and sin shall be thy portion. So this is again the great ideal put in front of the Kshatriya. That if you die here, you reach heaven. But if you abandon this place, then you get sin and therefore hell. So what Krishna is telling him is that it's better for you that you fight and die here than run away. Because if you fight and die, you'll go to heaven. But if you run away, you're sure to reach hell. Because that is the most sinful act for a Kshatriya. He will... By such a refusal, incur disgrace and the reproach of fear and weakness and the, law, and the loss of his kshatriya honor. For what is worst grief for a kshatriya is the loss of his honor, his fame, his noble station among the mighty men, the men of courage and power. To him, that to him is much worse than death. 
Well, obviously, this is really the creed of the fighter. We hear this from many a military man. Dishonor for him is worse than death. So for him, any kind of, you know, uh, this, his fame, his noble station, if he is, you know, dishonored and, you know, people say he has betrayed, you know, that's why in the army the court marshals are really very high punishment because once, you know, you are pulled off with your, your uniform, that's a disgrace. And people cannot live that disgrace because uh, for them, nobility, honor was the highest virtue. And if somebody says, you have been a coward, you have left the battle. So you see many movies, you have read many stories also, where at the risk of losing their own life, they return to the battlefield, take their friends away, or sometimes even a single person, you know, he really defends so that his colleagues can escape. So all these are there because for them they honor. Live by honor, die by honor. Any dishonor is worse than death. Battle, courage, power, rule, the honor of the brave, the heaven of those who fall nobly. This is the warrior's ideal. To lower that ideal, to allow a smirch, to fall on that honor, to give the example of a hero among heroes whose action lays itself open to the reproach of cowardice and weakness and thus to lower the moral standard of mankind is to be false to himself and to the demand of the world on its leaders and kings. Slain thou shalt win heaven. Victorious thou shalt enjoy the earth. Therefore arise, O son of Kunti, resolved upon battle. So, it's a conclusion and we have said this, we have explained this before. The slain thou shalt win heaven, victorious thou shalt enjoy the earth. You see, the options are not many. Slain, thou shalt win heaven. Victorious, thou shalt come back to earth and be a king or high, occupy a wonderful position that you are a great hero. And then, if you run away from the battlefield, you have the hell. So you want hell, heaven or earth. The choice is yours. This heroic appeal may seem to be on a lower level than the stoical spirituality which precedes and the deeper spirituality which follows. For in the next verse, the teacher bids him to make grief and happiness, loss and gain, victory and defeat, equal to his soul and then turn to the battle, the real teaching of the Gita. Well, uh, as we said uh, in the previous paragraph, somewhere we have seen that there are two answers, the two levels of answer. One is that of the Kshatriya and the, the first one as it calls it the general of the Aryan culture and the second one is the deep, deeper truth of our being. So Lord Krishna answers on these two levels. So till now we have seen more or less about the culture, about the Kshatriya, about the Aryan ideals, what these are. And I'll, according to this ideal, this is what will happen. You have either heaven, hell or the earth. So that is one way, you know, that's kind of, you know, what uh, perhaps uh, a common military commander would tell his army people. I don't think in the modern times he would do that. I don't know if in the western countries they do that. But in India we still, I'm sure some of our commanders would bring in this kind of a dialogue that if you really win or if you really battle for your country, you will go to heaven or etc. The Kshatriya hood, because in India we still have this ideal of the Kshatriya among the military people. So they may be encouraging the army by this Kshatriya ideal. But then the real teaching of the Gita is on the second level, the more intimate knowledge of the being. That is, I mean this is what is applicable to common man also. That's why I've been telling the first one is more or less for the times and particularly for the Kshatriya clan or Kshatriya class. But we are not so-called Kshatriyas going into the battle, into the 
frontiers of the of the nation but the second answer applies to all of us universally wherever we are irrespective of our country and and nationality because that is referring to the battle of life the kurukshetra of life itself not a kurukshetra one particular battlefield in some part of the country but every day every hour is a battle and that's where shri krishna's answer comes in and this is what is universally applicable as part of our own life so what is the second answer that this heroic appeal may seem to be on the lower level but in the next verse the teacher bids him to make grief and happiness loss and gain victory and defeat equal to his soul so now he comes with the question of the equality that in our battle of life we must have this question of the samata an attitude of equality where neither loss nor gain happiness or sorrow joy or pleasure joy or uh, displeasure all this opposites should not really touch you so you should have an attitude of a kind of an equality but indian ethics has always seen the practical necessity of graded ideals for the developing moral and spiritual life of man the kshatriya ideal the ideal of the four orders is here placed in its social aspect not as afterwards in a spiritual meaning this says krishna in effect is my answer to you if you insist on joy and sorrow and the result of your actions as your motive of action i have shown you in that in what direction the higher knowledge of self and the world points you i have now shown you in what direction your social duty and the ethical standard of your order point you swadharmam api chavekshya whichever you consider the result is the same but if you are not satisfied with your social duty and the virtue of your order if you think Uh, if you think that leads you to sorrow and sin then i bid you rise to a higher and not sink to a lower ideal so this is what we have been discussing that whatever ideal i mean the dharma of your order the four orders that we know follow that dharma and if you follow that dharma you will reach a higher destiny in your life you see it's not that it's only a civilian who is really a man of knowledge a brahmin who can go to the doors of heaven or who can go to the doors of brahman he says a kshatriya also can reach the same goal of heaven or paradise by following his dharma meticulously and so can the vaishya or the shudra man reach the same goal of heaven because in india and of course in most of the cultures we will see that everyone is given the same opportunity to reach the divine we won't call the divine but the ideal was a paradise but the thing is each one of us must follow the dharma given to us if you do not want to follow the dharma and you cannot follow the dharma of the kshatriya says then instead of running away from the battle of life battle of life i'm saying because it may be a kshatriya or it may be the civilian life you know running away means we are we accept defeat you know people commit suicide you know they become ascetics and they become you know they lose interest in life this is called the running away from life he says don't run away from life either as a kshatriya or a non kshatriya you at least follow the higher order which is you know we will see in detail rest of the chapters are what are this higher higher order in fact uh, he will explain later so at least do not sink to a lower ideal put away all egoism from you disregard joy and sorrow disregard gain and loss and all worldly results look only at the cause you must serve and the work that you must achieve by demand by divine command 
so thou shalt not incur sin. Thus, Arjuna's plea of sorrow, his plea of the recoil from slaughter, his plea of the sense of sin, his plea of the unhappy results of his action are answered according to the highest knowledge and ethical ideals to which his race and age had attained. But the last part of the sentence is what is important. To which his race and age had attained. So the ethical ideals that were attained at that time are not necessarily the same today. And we have seen why. Because today's man is not supposed to be belonging to any one of the classes. We don't want to be Kshatriyas or Brahmins or Vaishya or Shudra exclusively. In those days you had to belong to one of them. And of course in, even in one of them you had again further divisions. But at least you are a Kshatriya. You may have 10 divisions in Kshatriyas, you may have 20 divisions in Brahmans, you may have 50 divisions in the Vaishyas, but on the whole you belong to a Vaishya. But in the modern times, our ethics have changed. We are not supposed to belong to any one, but take up the characteristics of all the four. The knowledge aspect, the courage aspect, the, 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 the equality aspect, the distribution of wealth aspect and the perfection in work aspect. So we are supposed to integrate all the four aspects into our being. That's what I told you last time. This is the age of integration. So on the social level or so you call it spiritual level, you call it moral level, every level we are in an age of integration. So this integration which must spill over into countries and nations and religions, that is what is the message of our India, that we have to have an integrated vision of life, individual and cosmic. So we, we see here that according to that age, Sri Krishna has said, you are a Kshatriya, this is the Kshatriya hood, follow that. Otherwise, if you want to have a spiritual life, you can have a spiritual attitude that have this equality. Do not think of the enemy, do not think of the guru, do not think of your family, do not think of sin, do not think of unhappiness, do not think of all this. Think, have a, an equality, that means you go beyond the opposites. An ideal which he will explain in, at great length later, what is this question of equality? How do you go beyond sorrow and suffering and all that, pain and pleasure, etc. So he says, according to those ideals, Sri Krishna has given the two alternatives. One, the higher, there are spirituality and attitude of samatha and that are the kshatriya, the attitude that was the kshatriya uh, order. The last paragraph it is the creed of the Aryan fighter. No God, it says, Know thyself, help man. Protect the right. Do without fear or weakness or faltering thy work of battle in the world. Thou art the eternal and imperishable spirit. Thy soul is here on its upward path to immortality. Life and death are nothing. Sorrow and wounds and suffering are nothing. For these things have to be conquered and overcome. Look not at thy own pleasure and gain profit, but above and around, above at the shining summits to which thou climbest, around at this world of battle and trial in which good and evil, progress and retrogression are locked in stern conflict. Men call to thee, their strong man, their hero for help. Help then. Fight. Destroy when by destruction the world must advance. But hate not that which thou destroyest. Neither grieve for all those who perish. Know everywhere the one self. Know all to be immortal souls and the body to be but dust. 
do thy work with a calm strong and equal spirit fight and fall nobly or conquer mightily for this is the work that god and thy nature have given to thee to accomplish is kind of a beautiful summary of the entire chapter the creed of the aryan fighter but here again we see the same difference two levels of action one as a kshatriya the other more as a spiritual master a spiritual higher life that one is no god no thyself help man you see a simple thing but you have both the levels one the spiritual level no god and no thyself and on the social community human level help man this help man is not a philanthropic ideal this help man is the ideal of the kshatriya a kshatriya was it was his duty to help those that were in trouble and sorrow in danger in problems so is in that way you help man protect their right do without fear or weakness or falter in the work of battle in the world that's the kshatriya hood without fear you battle in the world and then of course because the truth as i said before that thou art the soul the imperishable spirit the eternal thy soul is here on its upward path to immortality so what is said earlier the journey of the soul it is there gradually moving towards its own higher realization and this life is only one milestone in its long journey towards immortality so if you can understand this then what happens then you gain the attitude of life and death are nothing sorrow and wounds and suffering are nothing so when this nothingness comes in then this is an attitude that will help you in your day to day life also is not only the attitude of the of the kshatriya but even for the common man the civilian this is the best attitude that at least you know the the army man the military person has to fight his battle but we are not fighting the frontiers but we are front fighting a daily battle inwardly so the best is that if we can take away this fear of death it will help us a lot to overcome this oppositions of sorrow and death etc now this second one is again a very pragmatic thing not only meant for the kshatriya but to all of us for all of us look not at thy own pleasure and gain and profit but above and around this is the the vast ethics of the gita put it very beautifully you see look not at thy own pleasure and gain and profit but above and around and what's the meaning above are the shining summits to which thou thou climbest that means the spiritual heights the heights beyond mind of course in those days there were no heights beyond mind there were no levels and planes of consciousness beyond mind above there it meant the purushottama the divine the god and around this world of battle and trial in which good and evil progress and retrogression are locked in stern conflict so as we said earlier the life around is a constant battle and that is why we would say the whole of life is a kurukshetra and then he is now telling directly arjuna that men call thee the strong man the strong man their hero for help help them fight so sri krishna is goading arjuna saying that you have been looked upon as a great hero so fulfill thy role you know sometimes people peg their faith and and hope in you in one individual and at that time if you fail then you are putting all those around you in great misery so at the cost of one's life one kinds of fulfills and keeps up the saves the faith of so many people 
and that is a greater sacrifice than trying to really save your life and then run away from the battlefield destroy when by destruction the world must advance well the present law of life is conflict is war is destruction and that is the rule of rudra that is really pervading or controlling this world it is not the rule of vishnu full of peace and harmony the rule of vishnu will come much much later but now is the rule of shiva and rudra there is a rudra shiva tandav destruction now the rule of creation is through destruction tomorrow creation will take place not through destruction but on the positive way but today it is destruction and out of destruction construction that's the law of life now so follow that but only thing is hate not that which thou destroyest so you see sometimes our military people they are given this kind they are pumped in this kind of hatred you see those days kshatriya were there as a duty they did but today we have to whip up the emotions of the military people by saying that country is bad that country is so these things that country is terrorist that country is dangerous you know you whip up the emotions of the military persons and build in a kind of a hatred but this hatred is not going to really that man if he fill it up with hatred he turns out to be a fundamentalist and a terrorist and one who can really give his life how do you think that all these people you know who self immolate who go with a bomb in their belly how do they sacrifice their life out of hatred but this kind of a death out of hatred does not say take you to any higher higher consciousness or higher levels of uh, planes of existence but if you did it as a dharma as a duty as saving your country well yes there could be a place in a higher level of consciousness but if you did it out of hatred no army man no military man would get a place in that higher consciousness so this is what is missing in the modern times there is military but a military which acts out of hatred for the for the person whom we are going to attack and that to all kind of a falsehood hatred is itself based on falsehood so you can imagine now there's no question of dharma you are fighting for falsehood and therefore the army man goes into greater suffering than what was promised earlier of the paradise no everywhere the one self no all to be immortal souls and the body to be but dust of course this one shri krishna has to give this kind of a extreme explanation of the body being a, being dust well it is said in christianity too that body is dust and unto dust it returns but we in integral yoga do not believe the body is dust and that to, and to dust it returns it may be constituted out of this five elements and it really when it is put into cremation or into into burial it returns to dust but essentially it is not dust and essentially it is not a thing to be just thrown away you know there are some religions who really it seems throw it from the top of a mountain to be the body to be fed by by vultures and by creatures by birds well they may have a reason saying the body is given as as feed to the birds each one has its own ideology there's not discussion about that but we would say body has to be much respected you see a simple thing that we can take from what the mother has written on the samadhi she called it the, the envelope the envelope of sheer abindos consciousness so the body is not to be disregarded as something you know for a number of years you it was instrumental you enjoyed it and it threw it away is after all the envelope of my of my consciousness 
it has allowed my consciousness to grow it has allowed my soul to experience so it may have its poor body's weaknesses its limitations its injuries its disease but with all these drawbacks which are not its fault but because it was born from the inconscient it has inherited all this drawback but in spite of that it has given your mind your vital your your soul everything a kind of a brilliant vehicle when it could not it says i'm sorry i'm weak i have exhausted myself you are not even take care of me so this is this is envelope so you must respect it that's why i've seen in some of our indian homes i've seen the moment the somebody is dead they put him on the floor or him or her as if to disregard and say put a little deepam at the head and put him on the floor but in our ashram we never put the body on the floor we give it a proper cot a beautiful white sheet and a beautiful white cover of course like many other hindu religions the ashram people also give it a good swapping make it clean put perfume it is it is is taken away with great respect so somebody a body an envelope which has served the individual soul so when its time has come it's gone and we should give it a farewell with great respect so that is the attitude here that it has served you take it with respect you cremate it and it goes with uh, quietness some people follow the system of merging the ashes in the in the sea well that is up to the individual you put it in the sea or you put it in in a river or it's up to you but from the olden times we have followed this all the ashram people's ashes have been merged in the sea here because of the proximity everyone lived here attached to this place so that's called the merging of the ashes so that is the normal thing it's all out of respect there's not one iota of this disrespect or oh, after all it's dead and now it's of no use get rid of it so and there also there has been a kind of a a time that the mother gave that within 24 hours the body must be cremated because after 24 hours she would say the life spirit the aura of life spirit around the body it disperses so within the 24 hours the body is cremated unless there is an exceptional circumstance normally bodies in the ashram land are not kept in uh, what do you call that uh, what is that called uh, where you put that uh, huh mortuaries unless there is a special thing nowadays they have started having those you know that cold uh, cue cabins all this is a modern invention but uh, given to the mother she would just dispose of the body within that time so this is the thing that no everywhere the one self no all to be immortal souls and the body to be but dust that was those times now it has changed do thy work with a calm strong and equal spirit fight and fall nobly or conquer mightily and that's for the kshatriya and that's for the common man we have to fight the battle of life calmly nobly or conquer it mightily but never give in to negative attitudes and commit suicide and go to the astra- go astray into into this kind of ascetic withdrawal etc for this is the work that god and thy nature have given to thee to accomplish this is the sentence that can apply both to arjuna and to all of us god has given us a particular life a particular message a particular mission in our life and we accomplish that as much as we can not only has god given us the mission but has he has given us the nature the instrumentation to fulfill that mission our nature is nothing but that instrumentation so we are both we are given both the mission and the instrument to fulfill so let us use them properly and fulfill so this is uh, i mean a beautiful chapter you have seen for the creed of the aryan fighter and then we have chapter 8 and 9 which are really really philosophic you can see the title themselves sankhya yoga and sankhya yoga and vedanta so tomorrow we'll take up this chapter 8 
but it should be ready for a good dose of Indian philosophy.